So first of all, let me thank uh, Professor Neto for the kind introduction. And, um, and thank you as well, uh, especially for the invitation to come and talk today and join in this celebration of 15 years of this, this really important project, Cielo. Um, it's a real honor for me to have been invited to do this, but it's also already been um, a, a valuable learning experience for me as well, because it's given me an opportunity to learn much more about Cielo and the contributions that it's made. Um, and I'm very grateful to conversations that I've had leading up to this with Abel and with um, uh, Dominique Babini and with Anna Maria Seto um, and also with Jean-Claude Guédon uh, as well, uh, who've given me valuable perspectives about Cielo, but also related uh, projects as well, like Redalic and, uh, and Latindex too. So I'm going to attempt to give you an, an overview of open access publishing, about, so, so, to talk about the progress and some of the challenges uh, that remain. I'm going to talk about some of the disruptive forces that exist that hopefully will accelerate the pace of, of change in this area. Um, I'll touch on a number of areas which will be picked, on, picked up on in much greater depth later in the meeting. Um, and what I'll try and do also is weave in some comments about Cielo as well, which I hesitate to do, in a sense, in a, in a room filled with experts in, in the subject, but, uh, but uh, so bear with me. So I'd like to begin uh, just by giving you a little bit of a historical perspective on open access publishing, uh, on how I got involved in it. Right, so this is an article uh, that was published 12 years ago in uh, science of all places. Um, and it's an article that presented a vision for open access which really resonated with me. And it resonated with me because, as Professor Netta said, my background is in genetics. And so the vision expressed in this article is very much inspired by genetics, by what had happened, in the sense that, you know, I'd seen at first hand how the accumulation of data uh, and the availability of that data uh, in the field of genetics had led to a whole range of new tools and resources and methods being applied to that data uh, and to mine it for, for new information and so on. And so the vision that's set out in this article here is, is about applying that same principle to the whole of the literature, to all of the findings that are being presented into the, in the literature, and to, and to create a resource, a completely open resource, which would then, in the same way as genetic data has, inspire the development of new tools and resources and approaches to mine the literature for new knowledge and to transform it into a much more powerful resource for research but also for education, for innovation and for economic development. And so that was the vision that was set out and it, it resonated with me completely. And so when I got the chance in 2003 to, move it, to, to, to work for PLOS, it was a really easy decision for me to make. So three of the people, whoops, three of the people who are Oh dear, hang on. Yeah. Three of the people who are listed as authors on this article are Harold Varmus, Pat Brown, and Mike Eisen, three of the, the three founders of the Public Library of Science. And one of the things that's really emphasized in this article is this idea that open access does two things. It breaks down the barriers to accessing information, but it also breaks down the barriers to reusing that information. And that second part is critical if we're going to realize the kind of vision that was expressed in that article. So open access is more than, than just free access, as I'm sure you're, you're, you're all aware. So the Public Library of Science was founded at around the same time, initially as an advocacy organization. And this was one of the first things that they did. They circulated an open letter, I'm sure, again, familiar to many of you, which was signed by uh, over 34,000 people from 180 countries in the world. And many people, actually, uh, have, the, the more critical people of open access have described this letter as a failure because it didn't change anything, because it didn't actually change publishing at that point. But I think you know, the, the alternative view is that it was a massive success because it raised awareness of the issue and generated a huge amount of support for the idea of open access and really paved the way for PLOS to take the next step, which was to, to become a publisher and to show that open access publishing could work and, could be, and, and open access journals could be as good as any subscription journal and could be associated with high quality science. Because at that time, 10 years ago, or a bit more than 10 years ago, open access was still a you know, relatively new thing, and some people were arguing that open access couldn't work with high quality science. 
So I think one of the early contributions that PLOS made was to show that it could by producing several journals that, that published terrific science. So, of course, PLOS wasn't acting in a vacuum at that point, and there was another very important publisher um, called Biomed Central, again, I'm sure you're very familiar with them, that were launched at around the same time, or a little before PLOS, actually, that were experimenting and pioneering a new business model, the publication fee model. So their idea was that if you could support publishing through a cost, a publication fee, which is paid by authors and ultimately by the funders of that research, if you could cover the costs that way, then you could eliminate any boundaries on the access and reuse of that content. And they showed, it after, after several more years, that you could, you could build a, a publishing operation that way, a sustainable, profitable publishing operation. And since, uh, since then, many other publishers have done the same. So PLOS and Hindawi and Copernicus have all shown that this model, this publication fee model, is, uh, is, a, is a way to support open access publishing. Another really critical development in those early years was policy development. And the Wellcome Trust, so this is a, this is a several of these pages come from the, the, uh, the Wayback Machine. So uh, I'm not sure they entirely represent the way the, the pages appeared at the time. But one thing to say is that web design has certainly improved a great deal since then. Um, but anyway, the Wellcome Trust were the first biomedical funder to mandate that their researchers should make their work openly available within six months of publication. And now, uh, there are well over 100 such policies throughout the world at funding agencies and institutions, and these have been an incredibly important driver of open access over those years, although it's fair to say that, in, uh, that there is not agreement about precisely what, how those policies should be formed and precisely what should be contained in them, as demonstrated particularly in the moment at the U in the UK, where there's a lot of debate about whether the policy that's, that's been enacted by the Research Councils UK is the right policy. So moving much sort of to, to recent times now, over, the, over these last 10 or 11 years, open access public, publishing has grown substantially. So this is a piece of work that was published in BMC Medicine last year. So there's been a lot of growth in open access publishing. But another question to ask is, how much of all the literature is represented by open access? And one way to look at that question in biomedicine, which is the field that I'm familiar with, um, is to ask, of, in PubMed, PubMed uh, indexes maybe a million articles, or around a million articles a year now. How, what percentage of PubMed is available as full open access within PubMed Central? And the answer is that that's been growing quite nicely over the years, but it's still only around 13 or 14 percent. So in other words, there's a long way to go. So although open access publishing is established and it's part of the picture, firmly and surely part of the picture, there's an awful long way to go in terms of full open access. So that in turn leads to the question, well, if open access is such a good idea, why, are we, why have we only got to 13 or 14 or 15 percent at this point? And where's the disruption? that's taken place as a result of the, the internet and associated technology that's taken place in many other industries, retail and media and, and, and so on and so forth. Why hasn't the scholarly communication industry been disrupted in the same way by the internet? And the answer I think everyone keeps coming back to is one of the main reasons is the way the academic reward system works. So the idea that as a scholar, you're going to be judged by the journal in which you publish your work. If those journals happen to be subscription journals, then that's where you're going to submit your work. And so as a publisher, if people are continually submitting their work to me, there's no incentive on me as a publisher to change from a subscription model to, to an open access model. And therefore, most of the growth that we see in open access is in new journals. And that takes time. It takes time for those journals to build up their reputation. So I think that's one of the primary reasons for why that progress maybe hasn't been as fast as we wanted. So what I'd, what I'd like to do now is to, to turn to some of the to three examples of disruptive forces that may hopefully accelerate that path towards a fully open literature. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is the concept of the mega journal. So I know this is going to be touched on, uh, uh, dealt with later in the, uh, in the meeting as well. So in brief then, PLOS One is the archetype, of course, of the mega journal. 
And there's really only one thing that makes PLOS One different from other journals. And the one thing is that the peer review process focuses on whether a piece of work is rigorous and belongs somewhere in the literature. So what the peer, the peer review process does not ask is how important is this work or which audience is this relevant to. Though the idea is that those kinds of questions can be left until after publication using other approaches. So that's the basic idea of PLOS One and it's been an extraordinary success. So this slide is just showing the number of publications over the years in PLOS One. It was launched in, right at the end of 2006. So the first full year of publication was in 2007 and it published around 1,000 articles. In, uh, it became the biggest peer-reviewed journal in 2010 and last year published around 24,000 articles and this year is on target to publish around 30 to 35,000 articles. So it's worth just pausing briefly and thinking about that. 30 to 35,000 articles. That means that if you go to PubMed and do a search, one in 30 articles of the 2013 uh, uh, contributions, of the 2013 articles in PubMed, in PubMed will be a plus one article, one in 30, which is pretty amazing. And this success obviously hasn't gone unnoticed by other publishers. And so there, there are now many more journals that have been launched over the past few years that look and operate much like PLOS One did. Some of them are focused in specific fields like clinical science, others uh, or genetics or uh, social science and others are more general um, uh, covering the same kind of territory as, as, uh, as PLOS One. So it remains to be seen just how fast these journals grow and whether they come any, anywhere near to, uh, to what's seen with PLOS One. But this concept is disruptive because of various features. And so they are listed here, so they're cost effective. They benefit from scale. And so the publication fees associated with these journals tend to be much less than more conventional journals. They're scalable because the costs and the revenue scale together. So they can grow, and if you've got the operational uh, scalability organized as well, they can grow quickly like PLOS One has done. They're great for authors because they, the authors get their work published quickly. They don't have to grapple with a journal that is where the editors are going to ask, is this work important enough for my journal? So they're good for authors, and therefore they are very strong competition for the conventional journals. Um, and ultimately, they become, because they can grow, and they can grow very big, they become open platforms for scholarly communication, and they begin to move towards that vision of open access, as, as, as mentioned at the beginning. It remains to be seen how, how prevalent this model becomes, but it's certainly, certainly in the area of biomedical science a, an approach to watch very closely. The second kind of disruption I want to talk about is, uh, is around the area of the funding of, of open access publishing. And this is really born out of you know, some of the conversations I've had with all sorts of people. It's, you know, the publication fee model is a very successful model in biomedicine in the journals that I'm used to. But it's not necessarily a model which is going to work in every country in every discipline. So it's really important to explore different ways of funding open access as well. And this is where I want to mention Cielo. So this is a kind of very simplified view, but the journals and, and the publishers that I'm used to have basically made the transition from print to getting their journals online. They've done the first part but they've got stuck at that point, largely. And also, they, 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 the journals look and feel pretty much like print journals. They, they haven't really adapted to this new medium. And importantly, most of them are still controlled access, subscription-based business model. The, the second part of the transition from online to online open access, that's proving really difficult for many of the established journals. And few of them have made that transition, whereas, um, most of the growth, again, you know, based on my experience, has been in the area of new journals like PLOS and, and Biomed Central and so on. But it seems to me that Cielo has done something truly remarkable, which is to leapfrog all of these journals and move from print-based journals to an online and open access format almost in one step. I know that's a bit of an oversimplification, but you know, that's the, re that's the result, that's what Cielo have done, and that's, that I think is amazing, and that I think has lessons that can be learned from others. 
The impacts of this are you know, not difficult to see, as, as I'm sure you are all aware, but this is a, a report that was published by the European Commission a few months ago, which looked at levels of open access, and there's been some debate about the absolute, absolute numbers uh, expressed in this study. But, they, but importantly, they looked at countries as well, different countries, and Brazil essentially came out on top with the highest levels of open access, and the authors ascribed that achievement to the effects of, of Cielo, or one, one, of the, uh, one aspect of that achievement to the effects of Cielo. So Cielo is very much a disruptive force, and I've sort of set this out a bit like I did with the, 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 the mega journal um, uh, features, if you like, because although the details are very different, there's also quite a lot in common. Cielo is very cost-effective, benefiting from scale. Um, it has been scalable over the years. Clearly, it's grown massively, starting in Brazil and, and spreading throughout Latin America and beyond. It's great for authors for a number of reasons. For a start off, there's no fee to publish in these journals. But as important, or if not more important, what Cielo has done is raised the profile of these journals massively and has also raised standards of editorial integrity in the journals as well. That was an, uh, a point that was emphasized in the discussions yesterday over and again. And therefore, because it's so successful, it is strong competition with convention for conventional publishers. And ultimately, it is also growing into an open platform for research communication. And in part because of the, the emphasis on interoperability within the CLO platform across nations and so on. So that's, uh, so that's also moving towards this idea of a fully open literature upon which new services can be provided. And at the heart of, of CLO's achievement is this association with funders. And so I want to mention one other example of that, which is the project that I'm now working on. I'll sort of spend a, a few, few minutes on this. So eLife, is an initiative of three funding agencies. In this case, it's the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Wellcome Trust, and the Max Planck Society. So they got together a few years ago. And from their perspective as funders, they saw a lot of the work that they're funding appearing in high-ranking journals, high-profile journals, but that the process by which this work was being communicated just was not efficient and not optimal. And if, from the perspective of a, of a funder, if the work that you're funding is not being communicated in the, fact, in the most effective way, then you're not getting the, the return on the investment in that research. You're not getting the maximum reach and impact of that work. So they felt it was time to, to take this on and to, uh, and to launch an initiative in research communication to address some of these issues. So some of the issues were around the editorial process, which they felt was too convoluted, too painful, and taking too long, and it's too inefficient. Another set of issues was around the way in which the content was being presented online. It goes back to this point that journals have migrated from print to online, but they're not using the medium. They're not using digital tools to really present new findings. And the third component is, of course, you know, this journal will be open access. That didn't require much discussion. So those were the kinds of motivations for the project. And the way they thought they could achieve the maximum impact in terms of this initiative was to launch a journal, a journal that would be a home for the very best science that's funded not just by Hughes and Wellcome and Max Planck, but by any funder in the world of biomedical and life science. So it's a broad journal, but also a very selective journal. And if that journal could operate and, and, and address the kinds of issues in the previous slide, that wouldn't just become a great journal, it would also have a broader impact as well. And that's, that's kind of one of the core goals of eLife as well, to have that catalytic effect. Now, one of the other principles of eLife is that it should be run by scientists. It should be run by active researchers who are eminent in their field. So one of the early things that, that was done was to recruit a team of senior editors to run this journal. Uh, so there's about 20 senior editors, and the chap at the top left, just to kind of emphasize the point in terms of the caliber of people, Randy Shetman, who's the editor-in-chief, was just awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine. So that's a kind of demonstration, a very clear demonstration of the kind of caliber of scientists that are putting their backs into, into eLife as an, an initiative and want to, to do better with research communication. I'm just going to mention 
briefly what happens at eLife because one of the key things, one of the, one of the aspects of eLife that at the moment is capturing people's attention and is generating a lot of positive feedback is the editorial process. So there are just a, a couple of things that are different about the editorial process. One is that for the articles that go into peer review, the editor that handles the paper, that's typically one of the 180 reviewing editors, that editor and, the, and say the two reviewers that have reviewed the paper get together in an online discussion and they discuss one another's views. And then the object of the exercise is for the editor to arrive at a consensus view on what the authors need to do in order to get their work published. So the author doesn't receive three different review reports and has to figure out how to reconcile different demands from different reviewers. What they get is a single set of instructions so they know exactly what they need to do. And the downstream consequence of that is that the, when the revision comes back, it's usually assessed by the reviewing editor without going again to the reviewers. So articles are tending to go through one round of revision and the, revision, the, the, the length of time in revision is also much less than in comparable journals. So that aspect of the journal is really working well. And so I should say we, we've been publishing for a year. We've published around getting on for 200 articles now. So in general, we're very happy with the start that's been made. Um, one last point about eLife is that we are, we are we're, we're focused on the editorial process, yes, but we're also, we're also very concerned to think about how we can present findings more effectively using digital tools. So we have a, a technology group within eLife and that group has just released a, a, its first product really, which is called the eLife Lens. And what this, what this exemplifies is the kind of thing we want to happen. This is an open source tool. We're demonstrating it on our own site at the moment. It's an experiment. So you can look at any article in this viewer. It's essentially a different way to read the articles with a text box down, a text panel down one side and another panel uh, which contains the figures and the tables and the references and so on. So you can navigate back and forth between these elements of the article much more easily than you can do in a conventional presentation. But the idea is that we will learn something from this. Other people can, can this, this, the software's in GitHub, so it's available. Other people can go and, and, and explore it as well. And in this way, again, we hope that eLife can become a catalyst for broader improvements in research communication. But just bringing it back to the theme, what we and Cielo have in common is a relationship with funders um, that, are, that, that, that emphasizes the, in, the, the fact that research communication is an integral part of the research process. And so having funders and institutions and researchers involved in that process is absolutely critical, I think, if you want to get it right. So the third kind of disruption that I want to talk about goes back so the question that I mentioned at the beginning, this obstacle to rapid development of open access, which is the current system of research assessment. And I think there are real, uh, there, there are real prospects for improvement in the area of research assessment. Research assessment is relevant to everyone that's involved in the research process, you know, whether they are the funders, the institution, the researchers themselves, the publishers, whoever. Uh, is involved in the research communication process is interested in the impact of the research that they're associated with. But the questions that they have about that, about impact and about influence, are variable depending on you know, where where, what their perspective is on science and what they hope to get out of it. Some of these kinds of impacts, impact is such a broad and rich concept, you know, some, some, some of it is very difficult to measure, so I just wanted to share an anecdote from a few years ago at PLOS with you just to, just to, to back that point up. So this is a letter that we received from a teacher, a high school teacher, uh, who says this. She says, Dear Public Library of Science people, I just listened to a mouse song online. And so she's referring to a paper that was just published in PLOS Biology, which was about male mouse vocalizations, which occur as a prelude to a sexual encounter. So these mouse songs were available to listen to. And she says, I don't have the funds to subscribe to traditional journals. She's a teacher, so that's not surprising. But tomorrow, my students will hear that mouse song, and, sh and they will be as enchanted and as interested as I am. The idea of open access to original research is very exciting to someone in my position. I can assure you 
that the availability of research papers will benefit the future of scientific research by providing motivation and stimulation for millions of fledgling scientists. You can imagine the kind of effect that had when, when we received that. Uh, it, it's just a wonderful endorsement of, of everything we're trying to do. And for the researchers as well, if as a researcher you know that your work isn't just fueling more research, it's also being used to inspire future generations and being used for educational purposes. That's a wonderful kind of impact to be aware of as well, but very hard to measure. And the problem is that all of this richness and complexity is often reduced to the journal impact factor. Um, and that is a real problem, I think. Um, now, there's a lot of ways to finish that sentence, and some of them are not very polite, but I'm going to be polite. So, um, the impact factor is a very blunt instrument. It's not without use, of course it has use, but it's a very blunt instrument to attack a very complicated problem. And I'm not going to go into a long critique of the impact factor because the problems are all very, very well known. I just want to highlight a couple of things. One is that it's a journal-based metric. It's, it was never designed to be a tool instrument. It was, it was originally designed as a tool to help librarians decide what journals to buy. So it's never designed, and it's a very poor predictor of the impact of an individual article within a journal, because within an article, you see massive variation in terms of the impact of the articles in that journal. It's also proprietary, which I have a real problem with, because for something as complicated and as important as research assessment, surely we need processes that are open, that are transparent, that are reproducible, and so on. To, to base so much of research assessment on impact factor just seems a terrible, terrible idea. And, it's, and of course, it's incomplete uh, in that many journals are not concluded, included in the impact factor calculation and so on. And there's much more besides. But you know, this is relevant to everyone, and it's, it's certainly relevant in countries like Brazil. And I want to highlight this one paper which was published in a journal called Frontiers in Genetics, an open access journal as it happens. And this is from a, a, a group of researchers in Sao Paulo who are explaining some of the incentives that exist for scholars in Brazil, in, in, in some institutions, to publish in high-impact factor journals. And there are some real perverse, perverse effects that arise out of those kinds of incentives. One is the fact that maybe, therefore, they're incentivized to publish their work not in the most appropriate journals, not in the regional or national journals that might be the most relevant journals for their work. Um, and even worse than that, potentially, there could be an impact on the nature of the, the scholarship that goes on, because if a researcher is trying to make their work more attractive to journals and editors that are based in other parts of the world where the research priorities might be different, you know, that can also create a problem. So these, these are, are really big issues, and I'm sure they're very familiar to the people here, so I, I, I won't dwell on them. But this article also has a more positive message as well, and that's contained in this top line of information, which you, you can't read, but which provides some data and links to further information about the impact that this article is having. And so this introduces the concept of article level metrics, alternative metrics, and so on, that again will be addressed in, in much greater depth later at the meeting. So I'll just provide a kind of a, a short overview of, of some of the principles as I see them. So one is that when an article is published th online, things happen to that article. And you can, you can measure those things. You can, you can identify those things. Um, and so, for example, an article might be cited uh, or an article might be used. And you can measure citations, obviously, using resources like Crossref and many others. You can, you can measure download statistics and so on. But there's a whole array of other things that can happen to that article. It can be covered in the media. People can write about it in various ways. It can be tweeted about, shared through resources like Mendeley. Or it can be used for educational purposes, cited in textbooks and so on. So there's all sorts of things that can happen to articles. And a lot of these things can be measured and put back onto the article itself. So you can create a dynamic view of what's happening to this article and the kind of influence it's having. So this approach has been, uh, PLOS has been one of the, one of the publishers that's been uh, one of the pioneers in this approach. And they've been providing statistics and information and data about their articles for several years now, a rich array of information 
usage data and other kinds of information of the type that I just described on the articles. And they're beginning also to provide contextual information as well, because it's, it's all very well providing data, but you also need to help people interpret that data. What does it mean if an article has so much usage or, or, or so much sharing in a particular field? You need to, we need to be able to understand the meaning of this data as well as just to make the data available. And this is a very early stages, but importantly, if this is going to work, then it's not just publishers that need to take advantage and, and, and take advantage of these approaches. And we're also seeing and encouragingly, we're seeing the use of this kind of evidence by other people, by funders and institutions, but also by researchers themselves. And I'm indebted to uh, Stephen Pettifer, who's a compu computer scientist in England, who uh, gave him permission to show you part of his CV. And so what, what Stephen does is he lists journal articles uh, as normal, but he's adding some information drawn from a resource called Impact Story about the amount of use of these articles, how much they're being cited, how much they're being shared, to provide additional evidence to support his own career development or his funding applications or whatever it is. And he's finding it very helpful. He's pretty, he's pretty convinced that this is having a positive effect on his career. Another encouraging sign is that this is becoming more widespread. Uh, this was, and, and another thing about this as well is it begins, uh, this uh, approach of article level metrics, is it begins to level the playing field potentially. It begins to address this problem of journals not being included in certain indices by, because any journal can use these metrics, regardless of whether they're indexed by one or other resource. These, 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 you, can, you can deploy these metrics uh, in, in any journal. And so one of the encouraging things that's happened recently was an announcement that uh, the open journal system, which of course has been an amazingly powerful force in terms of uh, supporting open scholarship and open, open journals, is collaborating with the Public Library of Science article level metric application, which is another open source application which PLOS has created, so that all OJS journals have the potential to, to deploy article level metrics as well. So that's very encouraging. But I would, I would just highlight one point which was made by Juan Alperin who was uh, quoted on this article. And uh, he gave, I think he's speaking at this meeting as well, and he gave a talk recently and it was brought to my attention. The point that he made was that this is all, this is all great, uh, but we are at a very early stage in the development of these initiatives and these approaches and we need to make extra sure that we don't fall into the same trap that we've fallen into with, with, uh, with the impact factor, which is to only focus on metrics that are relevant to certain fields in certain parts of the world. And we need to really think about that. So uh, I think that's a very important point, and, and I just wanted to emphasize Juan's point there. Um, if we get it right, though, the, the implications are broad and far-reaching and, and profound. We move from a situation which is focused on one metric where we now have a situation where we have multiple data types. And we're not just talking about quantitative metrics either. We're also, this introduces a notion of qualitative indicators as well because it's important what people are saying about an article or how they're citing the article. These things become possible in the context of, of, of these approaches. And I should say the last thing we want to do is move from a journal impact factor and create an article impact factor. That would be a disaster and I don't think anyone wants to see that happen. We're moving from a situation where we're focused on the journal to a situation where we're focused on the article and we're judging the article on its own merits rather than on the basis of the container in which it's been published, the journal. And also it's possible to, to, to not just focus on the article. We can move from, to, to, move, to think about other kinds of research outputs and think about data sets or software tools because you can measure the same things. You can look at the same indicators and, uh, and evidence for impact that you can with articles. So, you know, potentially this really opens up a whole array of new approaches when it comes to research assessment. And all of these ideas were very much the inspiration for the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, which um, uh, I, I was one of the people involved in that, um, and was released a few months ago. 
and has a whole host of recommendations for all of the constituencies involved in research assessment because in order to move this field forward, it's going to take a concerted effort amongst all of these stakeholders. So if you haven't uh, had a look at it, please do so, and if you agree with it, please sign. So there's a lot more to do, obviously. Now we have to go from releasing a declaration to actually thinking about tangible actions, and I think that's what we need to grapple with next. So I can summarize then by saying that what I've tried to do is to uh, give you a, a, a brief overview of open access publishing and lead you, I hope, I mean, I think we all conclude that open access publishing is very much part of the landscape now, it's mainstream. It may represent a minority still of the total, but it is here to stay and it's growing. That there are several disruptive forces at work, and I've highlighted the concept of the mega journal, different funding models to support open access, and this notion of reform of research assessment. And there's much more. Um, there are things like peer review platforms. That, you know, I've, I've only mentioned open journal systems in passing, but it's had a massive effect. So tools like op open journal systems. Uh, there are new journals uh, that are exploring different kinds of models for peer review. There's preprint servers. There's an array of experiments going on. So I think it's a very exciting time. And I think what draws all this together is this view that I've felt for many years, really, which is that open access is just one aspect of a much broader transformation that's taking place as we move from a system of scholarly communication which has been adapted to print over centuries, literally, to one which is now transforming itself and becoming adapted to an entirely new medium. So the last thing I think will happen is that we'll migrate 25,000 print journals to 25,000 open access journals. I don't think that's the way it's going to work. So open access will be a central part of that transformation. Um, and I just want to leave you with three sort of challenges which I think are pertinent today uh, and that we need to, uh, we need to think about. Um, so one is interoperability. You know, if we're to realize that vision that I talked about at the beginning of a completely open literature which is a resource upon which to build new tools and resources and so on, then the literature needs to be interoperable. An article or, or set of data in Cielo needs to be, we need to understand the relevance of that to another article that's been available in PubMed Central, to another data set that's available in an institutional repository. It's a really big problem and I'm certainly not the person to solve it, but I think it's a, a really important problem. Another aspect of interoperability is legal interoperability. So the issue of licensing is very important, that there's a consistent approach as well to licensing. So that's one. The second one is this business of you know, research assessment, which I think the, you know, the opportunities are really there to explore different, uh, different approaches, but it's a problem that we really have to tackle. And one thing that struck me about Cielo, maybe it's a, a, bit, of a, a bit of a pipe dream, but it struck me that if, if Cielo can be bold enough to leapfrog all these other journals into online and open access and achieve that kind of, that kind of transition, is Cielo bold enough to leapfrog all these other journals into a system of research assessment where different kinds of evidence are being used at the article level and leapfrog any concerns about the impact factor and leave the impact factor where it belongs in Philadelphia. Um, so, and then the last... <laughs> And then the last, the last challenge is around sustainability, which I haven't really said too much about, but it's a, obviously it's a really important issue. Um, and uh, you know, I, I said it before, the publication fee is a model that has real advantages, I think, uh, in the context of biomedical research in the world that, that I'm most familiar with in terms of bringing market forces into play and so on. But does it have broad, does it have, will it work across all disciplines and in all countries? And I think there are clear, these are, that's a very big question and I don't think the answer's clear yet. So I'm going to leave you with, with a thought that, uh, of, of Dominique Babini actually, who said in an interview, she said, we owe ourselves a global discussion about the future of scholarly communication if we're going to figure all this out. And I think that's absolutely right. And I hope CLO, I'm sure CLO 15 will be a place to have some of those discussions. So I'd like to just end on that point, really, and just join the others in wishing everyone involved in CLO a happy birthday and to wish you a, a, a successful, a hugely successful next 15. So thank you very much.